Hi, everybody. So, um, we're going to uh, do the lecture 25 by Zoom, like I had talked about. And today we're going to talk about mutations. Uh, we're going to talk about DNA in the lab. And hopefully, before Zoom cuts me off, we will get to the microbiome. If not, I'll record a second Zoom recording and um, send you the link for that as well. OK, so the learning outcomes for sections, uh, section 8.5, we are going to define the term mutation and discuss an example of a positive and a negative mutation. We're going to differentiate between the types of mutations. So we have things like frame shift, nonsense, silent, and myth sense mutations. We're going to explain the influences of single nucleotide polymorphisms, also called SNPs, um, on an organism. OK, so genetic change is the driving force of evolution. Uh, any change to the nucleotide sequence in the genome is considered a mutation regardless of its effects. Um, it's most noticeable when a genotypic change leads to some kind of a change in phenotype. It can involve the loss of base pairs. It can involve the um, addition of base pairs. It can involve parts of the genome rearranging itself. Uh, flipping pieces of the genome. There are lots of different ways that mutations can happen. Um, so I want to introduce a couple of terms. The first one is wild type, and the second is a mutant strain. And let me sort of warn you, wild type is, in fact, recognized as a genetic term, but it's not widely used, particularly in science. And the reason is that you know, we can't necessarily determine what truly a, a wild type, what the correct gene allele would be. Um, so for example, which is wild type, brown hair or red hair or blonde hair? Well, we know that there are different percentages of people with those different hair colors, but that doesn't necessarily mean that one of them is genetically correct for human beings. And so we refer to major alleles and minor alleles, so ones that are more common and ones that are less common. But your book uses the term wild type, and it is available in the literature as wild type. If you Google wild type, you'll get information. And so um, you need to be familiar with that term as well. So a wild type is a microorganism that exhibits a natural, non-mutated characteristic. And mutant shows a variance in one or more of the following compared to the wild type. So morphology, some kind of shape or uh, something that we can see in terms of its structure. Nutritional characteristics. So you may have mutant strains, for example, of bacteria that are able, either able to uh, use a different nutrient or lose the ability to use a particular nutrient. And that, of course, is going to have a huge effect on its ability to survive. Control mechanisms. So this is the ability to turn genes on or off, uh, which then, of course, has uh, a series of, of implications. Resistance to chemicals, so antibiotic resistance is a really classical example of that, particularly in bacteria. Temperature preference, so all of a sudden you may have the ability to survive in different temperatures than the original strain. Um, enzymatic function, so you can have anything from complete loss of enzyma enzymatic function to just a tweak uh, in the enzymatic function, so maybe it's only 90% uh, as uh, uh, functional as the original enzyme, or you can actually have an increase in enzyme uh, efficiency. You can have a mutation in the active site that actually makes it hold on to its substrate even tighter. Uh, so that might actually increase the ability of the enzyme to do its function, which may be good or maybe bad for the organism, but looking at it strictly at the enzyme level, again, a mutation can cause that. Um, there are different kinds of causes of mutations. So the first one, uh, the first term we're going to talk about is a spontaneous mutation. And that's just a random change in DNA, DNA arising from errors in replication. So when we talked about uh, the copying of DNA and we talked about the polymerases, we also talked about the fact that the DNA polymerase kind of reads that helix, that, that uh, major groove in the helix, and can actually detect when there is an incorrect base in the base pair, well, 
that's not 100%. Um, there are certain bacteria that are more error prone than others and there are certain polymerases that are more error prone than others and so some polymerases kind of let a certain number of errors go um, and so that would be uh, a spontaneous mutation there's also an induced mutation and that can be uh, an induced mutation by something that occurs out in the environment or in terms of the lab we may actually go in and create the situation that is more mutation prone. Um, so for example, uh, radiation is a really good example. We may expose bacteria to UV light with the hope that we will cause particular mutation. X-rays are another example, those are mutagens. And chemicals, so nitrous acid is one of those mutagenic types of chemicals. And so the induced mutation is the result of exposure to a known mutagen, which is either a physical or chemical agent that is known to disrupt DNA. And those are the examples. Okay, so then there are certain types of mutations in terms of what it actually does to the, the genome. So a point mutation is the addition, deletion, or substitute of a base at a particular nucleotide. Okay. And there are several types of consequences of those particular point mutations. So one of them might be a missense mutation. That's any change in the genetic code that leads to the placement of a different amino acid in the polypeptide chain when that mRNA is translated. So there are all kinds of things that can happen. It can create a completely faulty non-functional protein. Um, it could produce a protein that functions a little bit differently for good or ill. Um, or you can have a change in the genetic code which causes absolutely no significant alteration in the, the protein at all. Either you can have what we call a silent mutation where that wobble in the genetic code, that, that um, way that you have multiple codons that code for the same amino acid, well, if you end up with a different codon but it codes for the same amino acid, there is absolutely no difference in the protein. Um, another example is called a nonsense mutation, and that changes a normal codon into a stop codon. So basically what happens is the protein as it's being translated is terminated uh, too soon, and so you don't get the full polypeptide chain. Typically, those are completely non-functional unless it happens very close to the end, and it still usually affects the function of the enzyme or, or the protein. Um, silent mutation, I just talked about that. A base is altered, but it has no change to the amino acid because um, you have uh, all kinds of, uh, uh, you have multiple codons that will code for a particular amino acid. So ultimately it has no effect on the protein. A back mutation actually reverses or reverts to the original base composition. So you kind of have a mutation at one point and then it mutates back. A frame shift mutation, now these are often really devastating. So you have one or more bases that are inserted or deleted. So all of a sudden, everything past that point in the genetic code com codes for completely different codons, completely different amino acids. Um, it nearly always results in a non-functional protein unless it's very, very late in the protein sequence. Um, and again, even then, it can completely throw the protein off. Okay, so here is the picture from your book. And I don't particularly like this picture, so I'm gonna show you a different slide, but I would recommend that after we look at that slide that you go back to your book and you actually look at this table because it does have good information in it. But I think this is a little bit more human readable, okay? So this is kind of different views of the sorts of things that can happen. So I have a whole bunch of three letter words here. The cat ate the big rat. Okay, so those are codons. Um, and so I have given you what we're calling the wild type or major allele of this particular protein. Okay, so the cat ate the big rat is the wild type. So we may have a silent mutation. So you see the Q, but I've listed it in green. Remember I said that last 
place in the codon where you have the wobble is most likely to be the place where you have a more than one codon that codes for the same amino acid. Usually it happens in that third space in the codon. So in this case, we have an E changing to a Q, but ultimately the same amino acid is added and there is absolutely no difference in the final protein. So that is a silent mutation. An insertion mutation is where we have added an A in between the T and the E in the word eight. And you can see that from that point on, all of the codons are entirely different. Okay, so this is turning into an entirely different protein. Most likely it will be non-functional. A missense is where you get a change in uh, the codon and it will then code for an entirely different amino acid. So in this case, we've changed an I to an A, that's the red A, um, and BIG and BAG are most likely going to cause uh, a different amino acid to be added there. And a nonsense mutation is the CAT8 and then you have a stop codon that gets inserted or, or the codon that was there gets mutated into a stop codon. And so basically the protein is truncated and will most likely be completely non-functional. Okay. So these individual nucleotides that are mutated are referred to as single nucleotide polymorphisms or they're nicknamed SNPs, SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphism. And this is the thing where only a single nucleotide is altered. This tends to be passed on genetically, and usually when we're looking at connections between genetic background and disease, the SNPs are one of the things that we really look at. Um, identification of these SNPs is critical to the field of personalized medicine, and it's customized to, customized to a person's genetic makeup. And there are many diseases that we recognize that fall into this SNP-based model. Um, Thromb uh, thrombophilia, which is a blood clotting, um, yeah, blood clotting disorder, uh, is one of those. Um, hemophilia, which is another blood clotting disorder uh, that's probably more familiar, is also uh, usually a single nucleotide polymorphism. Um, sickle cell anemia is a single uh, single nucleotide polymorphism in one piece of the um, hemoglobin protein. Um, so basically these are point mutations in the genes for a particular protein that's incredibly important. Often it's in the active site of an enzyme. And basically in this particular case, uh, the codon for arginine becomes a codon for glutamine and they behave very differently. And so it becomes a non-functional protein. Okay, so we have talked about repair of mutations. So there are a number of different mechanisms that cells use to repair a mutation. So DNA has all of these proofreading mechanisms to repair these mistakes in replication. The cell has additional systems for finding and repairing DNA that has been damaged, okay? So UV uh, damage uh, has uh, something called photolyase, okay? So we can, um, you know, repair any kind of UV damage to the DNA using this particular thing. Um, typically, it's only useful for a small number of UV mutations. So if you have something exposed to UV light for an extended period of time, like those people who go out and bake themselves in the sun again and again and again, this mechanism is not going to be able to repair all of the damage to all of that DNA. So cells cannot repair severe widespread damage and generally speaking will die. Um, in some cases, those mutations stick around and become cancer and that's one of the reasons they have such a connection between exposure to the sun and skin cancer. Um, there's another type of repair called excision repair. And basically, there are enzymes that, you know, after a, a, a mismatch uh, has been identified, the enzymes go in right at the site of the mismatch and they break the bonds between those bases. And they basically, you know, like a little shovel, they pull them out of the DNA. And then there's a, a different base that goes in and, I'm sorry, a different enzyme that goes in and repairs. So DNA polymerase one is usually used for this kind of repair. Um, so basically it starts from that uh, 
open site in the DNA and it just sticks the correct bases in. And then ligase, which we talked about earlier in DNA replication, same enzyme goes in, repairs the NIC, and everything is the way it should be at that point. Okay, so mutations can have lots of different effects. They are permanent and they're heritable and will be passed on to the offspring of organisms. Um, most spontaneous mutations are not beneficial. Um, there are a very small number that will create variant strains that are more readily able to adapt, survive, and reproduce, especially if the environment changes. So as long as the environment is stable, mutants will only be a small part of the population. But if there's some kind of a massive change in the environment, some of these mutants are going to be better prepared to survive that environmental change. And so the old strain is not going to be as uh, able to reproduce, and so it will start to die off, and the mutant strain is then going to become the major strain of that particular organism. Um, drug resistance is a really clear example of this type of selection and adaptation. Okay, so uh, it doesn't matter if you don't have any exposure to a particular antibiotic, it doesn't matter whether you're resistant or not. But if all of a sudden that antibiotic enters the environment, any uh, organism that's not resistant to it is going to be killed. But the ones that have that resistant all of a sudden are going to become uh, able to survive in that environment and will kind of take over as the major strain. Okay, concept check. Which of the following types of mutations will have the most devastating effect on a cell? Point mutations, frame shift mutations, missense mutations, nonsense mutations, or silent mutations? And I have to say, I'm not crazy about this particular question because it kind of depends on what the mutation is and what it does. So uh, typically, uh, nonsense mutation uh, is, is going to have the biggest, uh, in, in these particular uh, cases, is going to have the biggest impact. But you know what? A frame shift mutation, that's going to mess up the protein from that point on. Uh, a missense mutation, well, it, it depending on where it is and what change happens to the protein, that can usually be pretty devastating as well. So. Okay, next section. So learning outcomes, we are going to explain the importance of restriction endonucleases uh, to genetic engineering as well as in real life uh, because endonucleases are something that bacteria have kind of as a natural part of its uh, uh, genetic makeup. Uh, we're going to list the steps in something called polymerase chain reaction. And now this is where we're really stepping into the lab. Uh, a PCR polymerase chain reaction is something that is uh, very widely used uh, in laboratory procedures. We're going to talk about how you can clone a gene into a bacterium. We're going to differentiate between DNA profiling and SNA sequencing. We're going to talk about synthetic biology, and we're going to name two genetic techniques that are designed to treat human diseases. Okay, so first we're going to talk about restriction endonucleases. And yes, these are widely used in the laboratory, but virtually every single one of these endonucleases is something that was originally um, pulled out of a bacterium. Okay, so this is an enzyme capable of recogni recognizing foreign DNA and then breaking that DNA apart. Okay, so it's going to break the phosphodiester bonds between adjacent nucleotides on both strands of DNA at the site that the restriction endonuclease recognizes. It protects bacteria against incompatible DNA particularly bacteriophages or plasmids. Okay, so this is one of the ways that bacteria can kind of fight off bacteriophages or plasmids that they don't want. But in terms of harnessing it for the lab, it allows biotechnologists to cleave DNA at particular sites. And that is incredibly useful if you want to snip a gene out of one thing and stick it into another. Um, it is absolutely necessary if you want to do any kind of recombinant DNA. And all of these restriction endonucleases recognize uh, a sequence of DNA referred to as a palindrome. That means it is the same forwards and backwards. So it's kind of spelled the same in each direction. Okay, mom is an example, M-O-M. -M. Whether you look at it forwards or backwards, it's the same 
word. So in this case, I've given you an example, ATG, GTA. Okay, so that would be the kind of sequence of DNA that a restriction end enzyme or restriction endonuclease might recognize. Okay, and what they do, um, we talked about them cutting through the DNA. Well, they don't cut evenly through the DNA. They make staggered cuts, and I'm going to show you a picture of that. It'll make a little more sense when I do that. And they leave these short little tails called sticky ends on the end of each side of the DNA where they've cut. They cut four to five bases on the three prime strand and on the five prime strand, leaving those little overhangs, those sticky ends hanging off the ends of both sides of the cut. Adhesive tails will base pair with complementary tails on the other fragment. So these restriction fragments are pieces of DNA which are produced by restriction endonucleases. Okay? And these restriction fragment length polymorphisms will cause differences in cutting patterns of specific restriction endonucleases. Okay. So let me show you a picture, and I think it will make a lot more sense. So this is based on an example that's actually found in E. coli. That's what the ECO stands for. So usually the E or the, the first letter is the first letter of the genus name. So if you shorten it, in its binomial nomenclature, E. coli, you would see the E. So that's the genus name. And the next two letters are the first two letters of the species name. So E, C, O for E. coli. R is for restriction and one. That's actually, it's not an I, it's a one. It's a, a Roman numeral one. And so many of these bacteria have multiple restriction endonucleases, which we then harness in the laboratory. So um, ECOR1 cuts this particular palindrome, so G-A-A-T-T-C, okay, and if you look at the other strand going the opposite direction, it's identical, G-A-A-T-T-C, reading right to left on the bottom, okay? So ECOR1 comes in here, it cuts between the G and the A on both strands, and you can see then at the bottom, it leaves these sticky ends. So A, A, T, T are unpaired nucleotides at the end of a cleaved piece of DNA. Okay, We can then create a gene that we want and we stick the complementary base pair on the end so that it fits very neatly right onto that restriction site. Okay, so let me show you the other piece of that. So, so ECOR1, uh, might be used to cleave a gene out of something that we want to put into a new bacterium. This is an example of a plasmid that has what's referred to as a multiple cloning site. So if you look at all of those, uh, if you look on the right side, you look at all of those names, those are all different restriction um, enzymes. So if you look one, two, three, four down, you'll see ECOR1. Okay, so that is the one that we just talked about. So there is a site that recognizes ECOR1. So if I have one side of my gene that I want to clone in, cut by ECOR1, and I cut this um, uh, plasmid at ECOR1, those gene, that gene will fit right in there. Okay, then typically I want to put a gene in in a particular order, and so I'm going to cut one side with one restriction enzyme, one site with the other restriction enzyme, and it will fit very neatly right into that plasmid. Okay, so here's an example of the bigger picture. So you melt the RNA, I'm sorry, the DNA uh, into uh, two strands. You then cool it off, okay? Uh, you then the, once it's been melted, then the restriction enzyme can get at it, okay? Uh, and uh, it will snip the, um, the plasmid. You have a gene that you want to insert into the plasmid. So if you look at the bottom, you've got that purple, which is the snipped plasmid. You've got that blue part, which is the gene that has been cut with that same restriction endonuclease. It's got sticky ends on either end, which match up to the sticky ends on the plasmid. It gets inserted. The gene is now in the plasmid, which is now useful for, um, for the laboratory. Okay, so there are other enzymes other than the restrictive, restrictive <laughs> restriction endonuclease. One of them is ligase, which again, when you snip DNA, often you have that nick in the DNA, and ligase is needed to repair that nick in the backbone. 
Uh, reverse transcriptate is, is often used uh, to take an RNA gene and convert it back to DNA. Um, it also is something that naturally is found in certain types of viruses, uh, specifically retroviruses, for example, the AIDS virus. Um, and, um, and as I said, we use it in the lab to reverse transcribe any kind of RNA into DNA. Um, I don't know if you remember me talking about my research way, way back at the beginning of class, but I mentioned that one of the really interesting things about DNA versus RNA is that DNA, chemically speaking, is really stable. So if I extracted DNA from one of my organisms, I literally could put it in a tube, put that tube on the bench at room temperature, leave it for a week, and as long as I haven't been really crazy about my preparation, I'll come back a week later and it will still be sitting there waiting for me. RNA, on the other hand, is extremely fragile. If you kind of look at it funny, it just falls apart into a whole bunch of different pieces. So when we work with RNA, the first thing we try and do is convert it back to DNA so that it's much more stable and much more easy to work with. Um, and the reverse transcriptase is the enzyme that we use to do that. Okay, which brings us to another technique that we use in the lab, which is polymerase chain reaction. And what that does is it rapidly increases the amount of DNA in a sample without having to culture it. It basically copies DNA fragments. Um, and it's an incredibly valuable tool. So it's sensitive enough to detect cancer from a single cell. So if you have one copy of a bad gene and you start copying all the genes, that's going to be, um, uh, you're going to get more copies and be able to detect it. Um, you can diagnose an infection from a single bacterium. Again, you're copying the genes, so you're able to detect it. Um, and it's a really quick procedure. So you're able to get target DNA from, you know, starting with a very few copies to billions of copies within a few hours. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how this works. So we start out with primers. And again, this is a very similar concept to what we talked about during replication, where you have primase that makes these little RNA primers that sits down on the DNA and is the starting point for all the replication. Well, we actually um, have um, companies that produce primers. And so if we're looking for a particular gene, we'll look for a DNA sequence on one side or the other that's kind of unique to that particular gene. And we will call them up. You know, primers are us. Hey, I need a, a couple of primers, one for my left side and one for my right side. They will make that primer for me. Typically, they're 15 to 30 bases long. And that's usually long enough to make it completely unique to a particular genome. Okay, and that's what we're looking for. If we want one particular gene, we want to make sure that we have unique primers that are only going to get to that gene. And essentially, those are landmarks on either side of the gene. So the primers lay down, and then we use a DNA polymerase. But the one that we use is from a thermophilic bacterium. Okay, so we are going to be using heat as one of the steps in polymerase chain reaction. And so we need a DNA polymerase that's perfectly happy to work at higher heat than what we have in our own uh, DNA polymerases that are in our own body. Okay, so the one we use is referred to as TAC polymerase. That stands for Thermus aquaticus. It's a thermophile. And uh, it remains quite active at pretty high temperatures, and so that's what we use for PCR. And then we use a machine called a thermal cycler, and that should give you kind of an idea of the process that we're going to go through. We're going to go raise the temperature, which does certain things, and then we're going to drop the temperature, which does other things, and we're going to cycle through high temp, low temp, high temp, low temp, and that's the process for copying. Let's talk a little bit about that. Okay, so up at the top here, we have a two-stranded chunk of DNA, okay? So the first step is called denaturation or melting the DNA. So you know that two pieces of, or the double strand of DNA, all of those bases in the middle are connected with hydrogen bonds. And hydrogen bonds are very susceptible to changes in heat. They will denature very quickly at certain temperatures. And so that's what we do is we denature the DNA. So now all of that DNA is available to be copied. The primers are uh, in the mix that we use. And so we drop the temperature a little bit 
okay? Just enough to allow those primers to anneal. And because they're short, they anneal really quickly, much faster than that whole long strand of DNA, okay? And so uh, the, we put the primers on either end, and then we uh, start what's called the extension. And that's where the polymerase comes in, the TAC polymerase which is perfectly happy to work at a higher temperature. So the DNA stays mostly melted, but those primers are annealed. And so it then makes copies of that DNA. Okay. So then you're going to have, much like you have in replication, two copies. But remember, we have two primers, one that copies from one end and one that copies from the other end. Okay. So pretty quickly, as you're making copies of this gene, one primer will slip it, snip it at one end, the other primer will snip it at the other end, so what you end up copying is just the gene that you're interested in, not the whole uh, piece of DNA from the entire genome. Okay. The next technique I want to talk about is gel electrophoresis. And this basically gives you a visual pattern of DNA fragments and it separates by size and depending on how you use it, you can also separate by charge. Okay, so samples are placed in little compartments in an agarose gel and then you run an electrical current. Okay, the phosphate groups in DNA have a negative charge, which causes DNA to move towards the positive end of the gel. So what you do is you start with the negative end on the top, you have your little DNA samples, and then at the bottom of the gel, you have a positive charge. And so that negatively charged DNA starts to move. But larger fragments of DNA are going to move more slowly because they're just bumping into the agarose. It just takes them longer to slither through that agarose. And so they tend to stay on the top of the gel. And smaller pieces are going to move quicker, and so they tend to end up at the bottom of the gel. So you very easily can separate by size on, use, on using these gels. And then you stain the gel, and then you also have what we refer to as a ladder with known sizes of DNA. So you might have a, you know, 100 base pair and a 200 base pair and a, you know, 400 and an 800 and a 2000, you know, whatever. So you have what's called a ladder. And so you end up with different rungs on the ladder at different known sizes. And so you can look at your DNA and you can tell very quickly what size that particular DNA fragment is. And so we refer to it as a genetic fingerprint. So this is a picture of the gel over here on the right, okay? So as I said, the larger sections of DNA are going to be towards the top of the, the gel, and the smaller ones are going to be towards the bottom. And on either end of this particular gel, we have those known size markers or the ladder so that we can tell what size we're looking at, okay? Um, okay. Uh, oh, one other thing I was going to mention. Um, one of the things that you can do if you're looking for a particular gene is you can run it along on a gel and you can cut it out. You can physically take a razor and you can cut little sections of the DNA out of this gel and then you can sort of dissolve it in a solvent and get your DNA uh, from, from the gel. So this is one of the ways that we can actually separate uh, DNA in addition to just simply looking at what size you have. Okay. Okay, so for DNA sequencing, one of the things that we want to do for a particular organism is to create a map, uh, a genome map or a sequence map, okay? And that will give you the exact order of bases in whatever piece of DNA you're looking at, whether it's a plasmid, which is kind of small, whether it's a chromosome, which is considerably bigger, or an entire genome, okay? So you can get all 3.2 billion base pairs of the human genome using these sequence maps. And of course, we, as we do more and more sequencing, we get these better and better maps, okay? So there is a process called shotgun sequencing that has been used to create almost all of the genome maps. And it was really a very clever idea uh, by a man named Craig Venter. Um, so it used to be that what we would do is we would do that PCR thing. We would make these special primers and we would get isolated gene and we would make copies of it or we would isolate a chunk of DNA and we'd you know sequence that and we'd do that a bunch of different times. Well, he said, now, wait a second. Why don't we just take a genome 
and just randomly chop it up and sequence all those pieces and then look for overlaps because, you know, sooner or later, depending on where you randomly chop these pieces of DNA up, you're going to get two pieces that overlap. And then you're going to get a piece that overlaps here and a piece that overlaps here and so on and so forth. And if you get enough of these pieces, you can build the genome essentially at random from scratch, just simply based on the way things overlap. So uh, what you do is you take a genome and you break it up into small manageable fragments, uh, meaning the right length to sequence. Um, then you se separate those fragments through a gel electrophoresis. Each fragment is cut out and inserted into a plasmid and cloned. The plasmids are purified and DNA fragments are sequenced. The computer then identifies those overlaps and it builds the genome sequence a bit at a time. Uh, and so the, the smallest groups are referred to as contigs, and then those contigs are built into scaffolds, and the scaffolds are then built into the genomes. So there are a lot of different pieces to this process. Um, and then it's looked at by human eyes. Okay, so let me tell you, this is one example of where your book is a little out of date. This is fundamentally the process that happens even today, but the mechanics are entirely different. Nobody takes genes to do a genome sequence and puts them into plasmids. It just doesn't happen anymore. Okay, so at the bottom, I've given you a URL. If you are at all interested in genome sequencing, this is a really good, maybe 15 minute uh, course by one company that produces sequencers. It's called Illumina, and it's one of the big manufacturers of DNA sequencer or nucleotide sequencers. Um, and I'd recommend that you go and watch it. It's not going to be on your exam. You don't have to do it, but it's really interesting. And this is a really good source of information for sequencing. Okay. So let me just sort of talk about that. So this is the picture from your book that matches that list of steps. However, that second phase where they talk about putting it into plasmids and so on and so forth, that doesn't happen. What I put on the right of your screen is an Illumina chip. And this is how it's done. So you take your sample, okay? If you start with RNA, you've got one step before this. This is where you um, uh, uh, isolate the usually messenger RNA, and then you reverse transcribe it into DNA. So that little sample in the tube that's that's got the yellow liquid in it, that's DNA, okay? But you can start with RNA and get there. So the DNA is isolated, the fragments are created, usually either a physical shearing or a chemical shearing, um, and then you add something called adapters. And this is where it sticks to the, uh, the chip or where you would actually clone it in using those multiple cloning sites. Okay, so you might put an EcoR1 on one side and you might put a, you know, uh, whatever, a, another restriction into nuclease on the other side. Okay. But like I said, the adapters that we use nowadays are the ones that work with this Illumina chip, okay? And instead of actually running the whole thing through the PCR, the PCR is done right on the chip. And instead of <coughs> doing any kind of um, electrophoresis, it's all done right on the chip, okay? Everything is taken care of on the chip. The chip is inserted into the sequencer. It is sequenced instead of millions of sequences. We're now talking billions, and by now it's probably trillions. I mean, five years ago, when I did all of my sequences, I got multiple millions of sequences out of each lane on the chip. Um, now I'm sure it's trillions, uh, or even bigger, <laughs> for all I know. So we do all of that. We sequence all the pieces. We then uh, either, if we're building a new genome, we align it, like we talked about, so places that overlap. And each time you add a new fragment, the contig gets longer and longer and longer. Then you can take those contigs and you can connect them together based on other information that you know, like how far apart two genes are in the genome, things that you uh, may know about from other research that's done. Um, or more likely, because so much of the biological environment has now been sequenced and genomes have been produced, you'll take your things and you'll map it against an existing genome and see where the SNPs are, see where the mutations are that you want to look for. Okay.
So now that kind of brings us into the subject of recombinant DNA technology. And this is where we in the lab deliberately remove a gene from one organism and combine it with a genome from another organism. Okay, so bacteria and yeast cells, um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, are often used essentially as little chemical laboratories, like chemical, chemical factories, and they make things for us. So you can take a gene for, say, a hormone or an enzyme or a vaccine antigen, and you can put it into these, uh, you know, an E. coli or a Saccharomyces or cerevisiae or whatever it is that you're using to actually do the generation. And you can mass produce any of these chemicals that you're looking for using these genetically engineered organisms. And, you know, all of the organisms are just spitting out little bits of protein, which you can then pull out of the media and post-process into whatever drug it is that you're looking to produce or chemical that you're looking to produce. Okay. So basically gene cloning involves removing the selected gene from an animal, plant, or microorganism. Okay, and you're going to use all of those same tools that we've talked about. You're going to snip it out using restriction enzymes, and they're going to have the sticky ends, and you're going to stick it into a plasmid uh, using those restriction sites, and you're going to then put it into whatever the organism is. Okay, uh, gene is going to be inserted into a vector, okay, and usually it's a plasmid, sometimes it's a virus. Okay, so anything that is capable of putting that genetic material into the target organism, okay, uh, the vector inserts itself, uh, inserts the gene or itself into the cloning host. So that would be your E. coli that's going to become your little uh, chemical factory. And typically it's a bacterium or a yeast, and they can replicate the gene and translate it into the desired protein product. Okay, so here is a picture where they talk about all of that. So you start with the gene that you've isolated up at the top, gets stuck into a plasmid, okay, using all of the techniques that we just talked about. So you snip it out using the restriction enzyme, you insert it using those sticky ends, using the different restriction enzymes. Once you get that plasmid, uh, you put it into the organism that's going to become your workhorse. And then you set up the ideal conditions for that organism to produce the chemical that you're looking for. Okay, so typically controlled uh, temperature, controlled pH, tons of nutrients. So you're going to feed that microorganism everything that it could possibly want because you want it replicating and you want it producing your product. That's so you want to make sure that you have produced the environment that makes it easiest for the organism to do that. Okay, so there are a couple of new, what we call omics, okay? And this is kind of taking a step back from an individual organism and an individual um, plasmid or something like that. This is looking at a, a larger study of an entire organism's genes and their functions or differences between organisms, okay? So uh, answering the questions, what is the different, the genetic difference between a human and a chimpanzee, that is a genomics type of a question, okay? Um, the next one would be proteomics, and this is looking at it not from a genetic level, but in terms of what proteins are produced. And that involves, you know, that gets past all of those levels of regulation that we've been talking about, okay? So this is what's actually translated by the organism, and there will be differences. So you may have an identical gene in two organisms, but if it's translated 10 times as much in this organism versus this organism, that's a big difference, and it can have a huge difference in phenotype. Metagenomics is looking at the genomes of all the organisms in an ecological niche. So if you think about the gut, we have at least 500 different species of bacteria and yeast that live in our gut and in a normal situation. Okay, well, what is the complement of organisms that live in the gut and how does this person's gut differ from that person's gut? That's a metagenomics question. Metabolomics is looking at all of the chemicals that are present in a cell at a particular given time, okay? So what is the cell doing at this particular time? 
All right, and it gives a snapshot of the physiological state of the cell and the end products of metabolism. So this goes one step further than proteomics. So the fact that a polypeptide happens to exist doesn't mean that it's actually doing something, okay? Metabolomics answers the question, what is the cell doing with that proteome? Okay, and then there's another one that isn't in your um, list that I think is really important. Uh, it's transcriptomics. Okay, so this is back at the RNA level. So we've talked about the genome, and we've talked about the proteome, and we've talked about the metabolome. We skipped a step in there. Okay, the messenger RNA. So transcriptomics gathers up all that messenger RNA and sequences that to see what the organism is doing at the transcriptome level. Okay, and um, one of the benefits, so, so a genome is just the, the base level of genes. You don't know how many times those genes are being copied. You don't have any information about any kind of um, uh, control, uh, metabolic control of that genome, how many copies are being made. That's the kind of question that will be answered at the transcriptome level. DNA is really cheap and easy to sequence. Once you get into proteomics, you're, you're looking at mass spectroscopy, and that can be extremely expensive and extremely time consuming to put together that proteome, okay? It's a really good thing to do, but it's much more expensive. Transcriptomics allows you to kind of bridge that gap. You're one step closer than you are at the genomic level, but you're not at the expensive place where you are at proteomics. Now, synthetic biology takes the next step. It's creating new biological molecules and organisms essentially from scratch. So people who are working in uh, systems biology are asking questions like, what is the minimum number of genes you need to create a living cell? Okay, so maybe let's say you have one of these tiny organisms, a mycobacterium, that maybe has four or 600 genes, okay? It's a really small number. Well, does it need every single one of those 400 genes? Would 200 genes still give you a living organism? Maybe it wouldn't be uh, as virulent, but it would be alive, okay? So Craig Venter, the same guy who did the uh, ch chopping up the genome and just you know randomly uh, sequencing and putting it all back together again, same guy created a self-replicating bacterial cell based on the four nucleotides of DNA, okay? So he was the one who started the process asking the question, what is a minimal living cell, okay? And it was a huge breakthrough. It was the first time a living replicating cell had been synthesized from chemicals. So this is the ultimate primordial soup experiment, okay? And it can revolutionize medical science, okay? so. What happens if you're able to replace the missing chemicals in a particular disease? Can you cure the disease that way? Um, assembly of customized immune components. So to make specialized T cells that can particularly go after your cancer, where your own T cells are not able to do it because perhaps it looks too much like any other cell in your body. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay. So, that leads us to treating disease using these kinds of techniques. And there are basically two types of, um, or, of mechanisms or, or uh, techniques that we can use uh, that are starting to be used today to be able to, cr to treat some of these uh, diseases which have been sort of recalcitrant to any other type of technique that we've used. So the first one, is gene therapy, where you can use some kind of a vector, whether it's a virus that you infect a person with, for example, or an organism with, uh, that will go in and replace a faulty gene. So, uh, you know, uh, sickle cell, you know, you're ba you basically have one bum copy of uh, a piece of a hemoglobin. Well, what if you could replace that with a good copy of that hemoglobin? Could you essentially stop a person from having the symptoms of sickle cell disease? Um, CRISPR allows a scientist to cut out an organism's DNA where they want to, okay? So maybe you can cut out that bad gene that's causing all kinds of trouble, okay? So these are kind of on the forefront of medical technology, and uh, it's currently being worked on in the lab, and these are two really important techniques that we use to do that. Okay, so question, restriction endonucleases, 
make cuts to DNA at palindromes, leave sticky ends at the ends of the cut DNA, are used by bacteria to protect against invading bacteriophages, those are viruses that are specific to bacteria, are important to introducing a gene into a vector when talking about genetic engineering or all of the choices. And of course, the answer is all of the choices. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go ahead because I think Zoom is going to cut me off. I'm going to go ahead and stop. That is the end of chapter eight. You're going to have one more uh, lecture to listen to, and we're going to talk about section 11.1, and that will be the last of the information that you will need to know for exam three. <laughs>